Hello, BookTube. I mentioned yesterday that one of the videos that's going around BookTube now uh, that I really like watching is people looking back on 2017 and listing their their favorite books, their best reading experiences. Uh, and I've had <clears throat> I've had a little thought as to how I could do that on this channel. The problem being that I, for years, have done an exhaustive list of the best and worst books of the year on my book blog, Steve Reads. Uh, and it felt kind of odd to just duplicate that here on booktube and it still feels odd i i am not <clears throat> i'm not finished thinking about it when i'm when i can think a little clearer in the new year i will revisit this idea of how exactly to do this on booktube in a way that neither simply duplicates nor undercuts what i do on steve reads um uh, obviously i'm not going to do you know steve reads had 30 or 40 books i'm obviously not going to do that in a video uh but i thought uh, this time around, since I want to join the fun of those of those videos, looking back at your highlights, your reading highlights in the year, uh, I thought this year I would just go through my top picks uh, on Steve Reads, uh, under the assumption that not all of you go over there and read long, long, long entries uh, of books, uh, and also just because you know those these books are so good, it doesn't hurt to cry them up a second time. Uh, I won't, out of simple kindness. Uh, be including here my worst fiction and my worst nonfiction. You'll have to just go over and see the unlucky recipients of that. But I have, uh, I have a list of the I think it's fourteen uh, winners <laughs> of the best books of the year. But I thought I'd just run down with you and I'll leave I'll leave the notations in the comments just for convenience. And then next year I'll figure out what to do, what I actually want to do. That's book to native, as it were. Uh, but I had I had a whole bunch of categories this time around. I one of the things I want to fix, uh, I want to do better in 2018 is more categories. Uh, but I start always with reprints uh, because it's, it, we have a fairly healthy reprint culture, and that that goes you know it commemorates the past before we start to look at, at the present. Uh, and there were a whole bunch of great reprints this time around, but the one that won for me uh, was Everyman Library that did a new edition of The Duke's Children by Anthony Trollope. Uh, and it really was a new edition, because when Trollope originally wrote the novel, the last of his Palliser novels, um, he wrote it in installments, you know, for publication seriatim, as as Victorian novelists tended to do. Uh, and then when it came time for him to assemble those into a book, his publisher wanted him to cut a huge number of words. And he did. And uh, that cut version is the version of the Duke's Children that, that Penguin and Oxford and everybody else have reprinted ever since, for 100 years. Uh, and uh, Every Man's Library here gives us a, a very nice, you know, affordably priced, widely published, one volume new version of the restored Duke's Children, the version that Anthony Trollope actually wrote. So, of course, that one hands down, the Duke's Children is one of my favorite Trollope novels. Uh, and I always like a, a reprint that does more than simply reprint, a, a reprint that makes itself a, sort of a watermark that all future scholars and reprinters will have to refer to. And this certainly does that. <laughs> uh, and then the next category was Guilty Pleasures, uh, the kind of books that no matter how much you might be enjoying them while you're while you're sinking time into them, there's always that nagging feeling that your time could be better spent. Uh, and I, uh, I had a whole bunch of those this year because I love Guilty Pleasures when it comes to reading. But the number one thing had no words at all. <laughs> the number one thing was a, a picture book called Treat uh, with an exclamation point. Uh, which was a follow-up to the the unexpected success of a series of books in which a camera was placed underwater and then a dog jumped into the water and the camera took a picture of their wild face just at that moment. Uh, and in this one, it's that a whole bunch of dogs are are told to sit still. <laughs> a camera is trained on them, a high-definition camera, and then a treat is thrown at them. And the the, uh, the bulk of these pictures are the look on their faces right before the best moment in the world, right before they get the treat out of thin air, or in, in a number of cases, fail to get the treat out of thin air. Uh, and you'd think an idea that simple would have would be, you know, the repose of five minutes of your attention, but I managed to sink hours into it. <laughs> uh, the next category was uh, debut, debut fiction, uh, which uh, if you've been watching this channel, you know that I love debut fiction. I grant it all kinds of uh, leeway, I go into it with an open mind. It's thrilling to think, in every single case, it's thrilling to think with every debut novel that we might be seeing the birth of a massively important career, 
a, a writer whose work will speak to lonely or bored or enthusiastic readers for who knows how long. It's fascinating every time to think this might be that writer. Uh, and I read a ton of debut fiction uh, in the year, but the one that stuck out was also historical fiction. It was See What I Have Done by Sarah Schmidt, a debut novel about the, the Lizzie Borden Fall River murders that she stood trial for, the murder of, of her, her father and her mother, and was acquitted for in court, but not in the public imagination, where she's forever guilty. Uh, and when I first read the description in an advanced catalog, I thought, well, okay, that's, I've read everything about the Lizzie Borden case, and there isn't much that you can do with it as a novelist. I mean, you might be able to play up the claustrophobic feeling of the house or the rough nature of the father, or you might be able to do something with this figure that flits in and out of the court record of this guy who was around the house uh, unaccountably and then gone, and who people people have accused of the murder, have said, well, it was him and not anybody connected with the family. Uh, and I was wrong. I would. I originally thought that was fairly unpromising material, and Sarah Schmidt just does amazing things with it. It's an amazingly memorable book. A tough act to follow. Uh, and then the next category was translation. I read, I've read a lot of works in translation uh, in 2000. 17. And the number one for me was a latecomer. I, I got it late in the year. It, it's, it's the Poet in Spain, uh, an English language effacing Spanish and English language translation of the poetry of Federico Garcia Lorca uh, by Sarah Arvio. Uh, and it was incredible. It, uh, ordinarily, when I, have, when I have a facing page translation of any kind in which I can read the original, I go 10 pages in and then I just stop reading the translation because it's so awful, <laughs> even if it's by somebody really good. If you have the original right there and you can read it, you're unbearably aware of how much is missing. And I almost never got that impression in this. I think Arvio's uh, English Lorca is incredible. Uh, so, I, you know, I it beat out a lot of other heavyweight stuff. Uh, the first woman ever to translate St. Augustine's Confessions, the first woman ever to translate Homer's Odyssey, and yet this was better. Uh, this was the best, by far the best translation I read this year. Uh, then the next category was kids and YA, and I heard from a bunch of both kids and young adults that, they, that they'd really rather that those be two separate categories in 2018. And... <laughs> uh, I can't really argue with that. I, I make it a point not to argue with children, and I'm I'm very seldom successful in arguing with young adults. So so, and that's it's right anyway. That the, I read enough YA and enough kids books so that I can make two separate lists for 2018. But in 2017, the winner was painfully obvious. It was a, a book by Jed Adamson called Shark Dog, in which a, a little girl and her famous explorer father are in the far corners of the world when they encounter a shark dog, <laughs> a dog with a fin on his back. <laughs> uh, and they, they take him home, and he is wonderful. He's a little bit confused as to when he should be acting like a dog and when he should be acting like a shark. Uh, but eventually he seems to get lonely for other shark dogs. And they make the tough decision to take him back home. Uh, and the ending of the book is wonderful. Just it, it put a smile on your face. Uh, and then the next category was mystery. Uh, and the winner was The Road to Ithaca by Ben Pastor, a book I think I, we saw on this channel, uh, which was uh, like another book on the list, the latest Bernie Gunter novel by Philip Kerr. This book was also about a, an upright, uh, morally sound man who's forced to uh, solve murders and prevent further crimes while working for the Nazis during World War II, in this case on the island of Crete. Uh, and uh, I thought it was... Wonderful, uh, brutal, gritty, but wonderful. Uh, and brutal and gritty certainly applies to the next book, which was the best sci-fi fantasy. Uh, I've also heard from a few people that sci-fi and fantasy should have separate lists. I'm not quite so sure I agree with that. I've never really understood people who say that sci-fi and fantasy are two different kinds of books. In, to me, they seem identical. The, and the, the differences are only uh, cosmetic. In both cases, you are positing a world that operates by radically different rules than the ones we observe. And you've worked out those rules, and you've worked out that world. But in both cases, you are positing a world that is impossible. You're just, it's just two different, very slight 
geographic variations on that impossibility. I, in other words, I don't see any, myself, I don't see any fundamental difference between the one ring of power and faster than light star drives. Uh, but <laughs> a number of purists in both camps have been urging me to make two separate lists. And I might do that in 2018, just because the more lists, the merrier. But for this year, I did, uh, I did them combined. And the winner was C. Robert Cargill's Sea of Rust, a novel uh, that takes place after, long after the uh, extinction of mankind. There are no humans on Earth anymore. Earth is entirely populated by robots. Uh, and some of those robots are uh, prefer to keep their programming independent of these giant and very hungry AI conglomerations that are spreading across the world. And those independent robots aren't heroes just de facto. They prey on each other. Uh, but even so, when I first read the description, I thought, well, a book that has no humans in it, how on earth are you going to interest me in what one toaster does to another? But Cargill's a fantastic writer. I was hooked from the beginning. Uh, then the, the next category is uh, romance. <laughs> and I read a ton of romances in 2017. And uh, I, I have been, uh, been you know, tweaked very often by people that my best romance lists uh, really show personal bias, more so than a lot of the other lists do, because I love historical romances. I love Regency romances. And Regency romances tend to be what I read, and that shows up invariably in the end list. Now, this year, I think I was less guilty of that than in other years. There's a lot of contemporary stuff on the list this year. But the winner is still a Regency romance. It's Lady Be Bad by Megan Frampton, uh, which is a, a novel about a young woman who's uh, compelled to make a really good respectable marriage in order to save her family's name uh, and and has already arranged this and is just ready to march off to her fate when she meets her intended groom's uh, dashing brother. <laughs> and and it, that sort of changes, it, it puts a wrench in the plot, but Megan Frampton is so good that even a predictable wrench is still fantastic to read. So so that, that got my number one spot. Uh, the next one is... Uh, Historical fiction, and it's a bit of a surprise for me. Ordinarily, I would think that the, my, that the best historical fiction of the year would be some gigantic operatic work, but this was a slim thing, and from a smaller publisher, from Europa Editions. It's The Revolution of the Moon by Andrea Camilleri, uh, about a weird political contretemps in, in 17th century uh, Sicily that for, for a month gave control of the whole kingdom to a woman. And it's, it's sort of a you know, a, a look at her brief tenure and her life and frustrations and exaltations. And it beat everything else. <laughs> it beat a very strong year for historical fiction. I, I have read it now three times and just got more of it, out of it every time. It, it was, this is by, it's by an author of murder mysteries. And as I've so often found to be the case, authors of regular repeatable genre fiction, murder mysteries, that sort of thing, uh, often yearn to strike out and do something more serious. Uh, I, they usually do it at much greater length than this book, but uh, this this showed things that were not present in any of this author's murder mysteries, and I loved it, just loved it. Uh, then the uh, the next category, we're getting near the end, don't worry, is, is uh, science and nature. And once again, I had a couple of people, including a couple of scientists, say, that they would really like it if those were two different categories in 2018. I read enough science and enough nature so as not to combine them. And I, I might do all of this. I might just do a list palooza at the end of 2018. Uh, but in the meantime, they were combined. And the number one was, all, all, again, almost no text. The, the number one winner, despite the erudition and the research and the, the narrative chops of all the other books on the list, the number one entry was very light on prose and very heavy on pictures. It was the photo arc done by uh, Joel Sartori for National Geographic in which he uses an extremely high definition camera and a black background to take close up high detailed pictures, faces of animals. Walks them on, on stage, calms them down, has their handlers right there, uses a telephoto lens, whatever it takes to get incredible, unguarded pictures of the faces of our fellow Earthlings. So many of them, hundreds of them. And it it's amazing. 
It, it, you, it, again, it sounds like a simple idea until you actually look at it, until you clear your mind, get everything out of your, out of your, off your schedule and just sit down with it. And then it's amazing. It's amazing. Uh, and I, I'm greatly looking forward to, uh, there's a new one coming out, uh, in 2018 on just birds. I am, I'm looking forward to that, but this one hands down for, for this year, I feel sorry because I, a lot of the books that I read that actually had prose and weren't just pictures were excellent. But this was, in terms of making you understand things about nature that you didn't understand before, this does it on, more in two pages than every, any other book does in hundreds. Uh, then we get to the, the, uh, the, the big four. And we'll, if, again, we're skipping the worst fiction and the worst nonfiction. So we'll do, uh, the next category is best history. Uh, and for me, it was a doorstop of a thing. It was The House of Government by Yuri Slezkin a big thick thing in which he gives us the occupant by occupant, apartment by apartment history of a big apartment complex across the river from the Kremlin at the height of, uh, of Soviet Russia. And, and by telling the stories of these people and the lives they led before they came to the house of government, which was the name of the complex and the lives they led when they were there and the lives they led afterwards, including uh, when they got the knock at the door at night and, realized they had fallen out of favor and were going to see sunrise, uh, that those stories, Slezkin works them into this massive Tolstoy-style tapestry that eventually tells an amazing story. It tells the story of an entire governmental system in a way that I just, I mean, 2017 was suffused with books about the Russian Revolution and its aftermath, and this beat them all so easily. So so amazingly, uh, I may be the only critic who's read it twice, uh, and I could easily foresee when it comes out in paperback next year, reading it again. Uh, it, it's an amazing reading experience. It's a marathon, not a sprint, so it's not rec it's not recommendable for everybody. But oh, what a book! Uh, and then biography. Uh, when it comes to my favorite genre, biography, uh, it was a biography of someone I don't even like. It was a, a book called Robert Lowell, Setting the River on Fire, by K. Redfield Jameson. Uh, in which she, she the, I mean, there's a great biography of Robert Lowell by Ian Hamilton, and this book is even better. It's more sensitive about his writing. It's more sensitive about his mental health, especially in light of all sorts of stuff that we know now about mental health that we didn't know even when Hamilton was writing his own book. It's more sensitive about the effects that has on the people around him. It's just a, an amazingly insightful book at the human Robert Lowell. I, I didn't like him any more than when I finished the book than I did when I started. But uh, it was an amazing reading experience. Um, but the best biography I read in 2018, and I read a lot of biographies in 2018. Uh, and then there were the big two, uh, fiction and nonfiction. Uh, and for fiction, it was The Ministry of Utmost Happiness by Arundhati Roy. Uh, a just diamond compact novel in which, it, again, I read it twice and was just astounded by the the depth of it by the the pitilessness of it it just and also the beauty of it you'd get through some horrible harrowing scene and there would be this uh, just two line semi poetic insight that would just carry you along to the next harrowing scene but was it it totally unsettled you it was an amazing reading experience for me and that's saying something because 2018 or 2017 was a really strong year for the made-up stories it, it they were they really put in a good showing both debut and established uh but for me this beat them all uh and then the best nonfiction of the year was a technically a cheat uh because it wasn't brand new it was a, it could almost have been on the reprint list uh but there was enough about it, and it was re repackaged, and it was freshly wonderful. Uh, it's uh, Golden Legacy by Leonard Marcus. His generously illustrated history of the little golden books, <laughs> the, the children's little golden books that, are, that have been such a formative part of so many people's reading experience. And it, it turns out that the stories behind those books are ten times more fascinating than the stories in those books. Uh, I was just completely caught up in it. I, I loved it. I love the fact that Leonard Marcus has such a perfect ear for anecdote. He never lets a great story go by. He gets them all. <laughs> uh, and uh, weaves them together into this story. of the, It's a little story. It's a footnote to history. But still, I loved it. Absolutely loved it. For me, it was the best nonfiction book of the year. Uh, and that's it. That is, uh, that is my own 
uh, for now, my own version of my favorite books of 2017. Uh, in 2018, I will come up with a, a different way to do this, I think. A way that's native to BookTube, a way that isn't just me reading results from somewhere else. I'll figure out what it is. I don't know, but uh, I have time to think about it. Uh, but in the meantime, I will, I will see you soon. <laughs> Thank you, BookTube.